John just records that bare effect. He says, there they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Mark and Matthew repeat this, but they both go on to say that Jesus on the cross was mocked by various onlookers and by the two men crucified with him. And then Luke does something different. He builds a little drama around Jesus and the wrongdoers. He separates the two men and individualizes them in a way that the other Gospels do not. One joins in the taunting and the other, an idealized character, does something very positive and humane. He has an exchange with Jesus that culminates in Jesus' great promise, today you will be with me in paradise. In a way, Jesus' words seem to present an either-or picture. Words addressed to one wrongdoer might mean that they are not addressed to the other. Paradise for one could imply a different fate for the second. But Luke is never quite that simple. He's a very skillful writer and presents, presents quite a complex narrative. We all know the crucifixion story so well that sometimes we are almost blind and deaf to it. It's Passover time in Jerusalem, a time when the city is thronged with pilgrims from all over the Jewish world. A very volatile time when both Jewish and Roman authorities are on high alert for any kind of trouble. According to Luke, Jesus has been targeted by the chief priests, scribes and leaders almost from the time he arrived in Jerusalem. Luke records how they want to trap him and lay hands on him and kill him, but could do nothing because he had the support of the people. But eventually Satan got involved and entered Judas Iscariot, who arranged for Jesus to be arrested. So Jesus spends the night going from the high priest's house to Pilate, to Herod, and back to Pilate again, who must deal with a tricky situation that he would rather avoid. By now, there's a mob gathered at his headquarters, and Pilate knows their mood is dangerous, telling the crowd that neither he nor Herod have found Jesus guilty of anything, he says that he will release him, but not until after he has flogged this man, whom he admits to be innocent of any crime, itself a perversion of justice. For some reason that the Gospel does not explain, the crowd demands that instead, Barabbas, an insurrectionist and a murderer, who is due for execution, be exchanged for Jesus. Twice Pilate tries to reason with them, but to no avail and eventually he capitulates. So Jesus is handed over and led away. And now, in verse 32, in the Gospel, the wrongdoers enter. Luke tells us, two others also, who are criminals, were led away, the same language as Jesus, to be put to death with him. While Luke records that just Jesus and two others were due for crucifixion on this day, it's quite likely that a larger number than this were executed. Rome was very efficient in going about its business, and mass executions were common and efficient. But Luke chooses to highlight two wrongdoers, not three or four or more. This is because, throughout the Gospel, he has what some call a preference for pairs, others call narrative twins, and others call triangular situations. This means that two characters, one idealized and the other more realistic, encounter Jesus and respond differently to him. For example, a reader of the Gospel has already met Simon and the anointing woman, Levi and the Pharisees, Martha and Mary, Zacchaeus and the disapproving crowd. Here, by introducing two wrongdoers, there is an expectation that here is another pair who will be juxtaposed or compared and contrasted with one another and will face decisions concerning Jesus. So we have two and we have wrongdoers. It's hard to know what to call them, so I generally use wrongdoers. In English translations of the New Testament, they can be thieves, bandits, criminals, outlaws, brigands. The Greek word that Luke uses, kakurgos, is a broad expression for any kind of lawbreaker. 
It could mean anyone from a minor offender to someone engaged in something far more serious. There are various terms that Luke provides concerning them. The first two concern insurrection and murder, stasis and phonus, and are associated with Barabbas. The third term that Luke provides is listes. Listes is what Mark, Matthew and John call them. The Luke narrator uses this in the parable of the Good Samaritan to describe the bandits who stripped, beat and left half dead the traveller on the road to Jericho. Listes is also a term rejected by Jesus on the occasion of his arrest. Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit, a listes? So, although we don't know exactly of what crime the wrongdoers are, are accused, we do know that in first century Roman Judea, capital punishment was usually reserved for individuals who threatened the empire under Roman legal procedures and against dangerous and violent murderers and robbers under both Roman and Jewish practices. We might presume that somewhere here the wrongdoers belong. The Romans and the Jews shared various execution practices, stoning, burning, beheading, strangulation. The Romans could also poison, drown, or throw victims to the beasts. It was clearly a time when life was cheap and violent death was common. We also know what kind of people were crucified. The Romans reserved crucifixion, something they got from the Persians, for the poorest and lowliest members of society, very often slaves. As a matter of precedent, but not law, the Romans refrained from crucifying citizens, deeming it too shameful and squalid a death. It was a dreadful way to die, made worse because the actual dying was so protracted and often took days. So from the very fact that they are being crucified, the wrongdoers are poor, marginalised, peripheral and expendable. Nobody's probably best describes them in the eyes of the world. In other words, they are an extreme example of Jesus' kind of people, the kind with whom he mixed and associated in his ministry, and with whom he is now, fittingly, on his way to die. In various ways, the audience is being drawn towards these people, individuals from whom, possibly as dangerous criminals, they might otherwise feel distanced. This sense of empathy arises from a combination of factors. First, there is an awareness that the two men are facing an imminent and horrible death, designed to cause maximum pain and humiliation to its victims, and to strike terror into the general population. Second, the audience responds to the fact that the pair are going to die with Jesus, and there is relief that Jesus will have the consolation of companionship in his last moments, and with the kind of outcasts with whom he always mixed. The solidarity that the wrongdoers offer Jesus merely by their presence contrasts with Peter's recent bravado, who at 22-23 declared, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death, only to deny him three times before the high priest's servants. Instead, ironically, rather than Peter, the insider and close companion of Jesus, it is the wrongdoers, society's rejects, nameless strangers, who sat in death row and now join Jesus in his execution. Although verse 32 is where the wrongdoers enter the gospel, we are to understand that Jesus and the pair underwent all are part of their journey to the execution place together. At this stage, nothing indicates whether the two know one another or whether they are strangers who just happen to be in each other's company because this is the day on which the Romans conduct executions. What we do know from Roman practice is that each man is carrying a crossbeam, a patibulum, what Luke calls the Stauros, that will be affixed to the upright portion of the cross, the stipes, when they reach their destination. Furthermore, each man, or someone in front of him, is likely to be carrying or wearing around his neck a plaque or tablet, 
bearing his name and the charge against him, later to be fixed over the cross. It was an exercise in popular communication, one way of publicising the cause of execution for the purpose of deterrence. The audience knows that Jesus was beaten during the night in the high priest's house. The wrongdoers too were almost certainly beaten by their jailers, since by Roman law, flagellation usually accompanied a death sentence. Although Pilate mentioned another flogging for Jesus, Luke does not tell us if that actually happened. On their journey to the skull, the wrongdoers witness everything that the narrator describes in the Gospel. A frail Jesus, too weak to carry the crossbeam. Simon of Cyrene, being pressed ganged by the soldiers to help him. The wailing women, who turned out for many executions in an act of religious merit. And Jesus' words to them about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. They may even have been close enough to hear the earlier commotion over Barabbas and Pilate's decision to free him. If so, it would only be human of them to wonder why Barabbas and not them, and why the exchange for Jesus. There is no description of the crucifixion itself. Historical sources contain very few details of the actual procedure. It was considered so offensive that elite writers of the ancient world wanted nothing to do with it. In any case, the audience would not have needed much detail, as crucifixion was a common, notorious and feared form of capital punishment. It was usually carried out at a place of maximum exposure, possibly on high ground and on main roads into towns and cities. As occasions of vulgar public entertainment, crucifixions often drew large crowds. But because it was generally a lingering death, it did not have the same spectacular appeal of burning or being thrown to the animals. The satisfaction after crucifixion was gained from seeing the victim first attached to the crossbeam with either nails or ropes, and then being hoisted onto the cross. After that, people generally went away. It is likely that the three men were stripped naked or semi-naked as a final humiliation. While stripping was degrading for all victims, signifying their nothingness and helplessness, it was particularly shameful for Jews. For them, modesty was connected with holiness, and nakedness was, was considered an offence to the divine. Luke continues the solidarity of Jesus and the wrongdoers. He tells us, When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Having arrived together, the three are now crucified together. Jesus' middle position fulfills the words that he spoke about himself at the Last Supper, citing Isaiah, and he was counted among the lawless. The emphasis on the centrality of Jesus creates a spatial symmetry, allowing readers to picture the scene and to focus on Jesus, the one in the prominent central position. The description enables the readers to see what anyone that day at the skull would have seen, whether the crowds, the soldiers, the leaders, the execution squad, the acquaintances of Jesus, his women followers, casual passers-by on the highway, and any family or friends who may have accompanied the wrongdoers. At this point, the wrongdoers disappear temporarily from the narrative. They are not mentioned again until verse 39, leaving Jesus at the centre of audience attention. However, they are present throughout the intervening verses, as close observers and interpreters of events. This is what they see and hear. So Luke tells us, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. 
So the wrongdoers hear a forgiving Jesus speaking to a father and mocking and taunting coming from two sources, the leaders and the soldiers, using language and ideas suited to their different religious and cultural backgrounds. The Jewish leaders talk about the Messiah, God, his chosen one, the Roman soldiers about King of the Jews. Each group in its own way challenges the identity of Jesus, who he is, and demands that he prove his messiahship and kingship by saving himself, by coming down from the cross and escaping death. From the point of view of the wrongdoers, the mocking of Jesus was not surprising, as the ridiculing of those crucified was commonplace. However, much else must have appeared unusual. First, Jesus is depicted as praying continuously for his enemies, asking his Father for their forgiveness. Second, the silence of the crowd was unsettling, as it was normally they who would lead the abuse. Third, the presence of the Jewish leaders was unexpected. They would not normally attend an execution, especially on this day, the eve of Passover. Clearly, their presence marked the victim as of particular importance. And fourth, the jeering was accompanied by exalted titles, Messiah, God's chosen one, King of the Jews, and by saving terminology, he saved others, let him save himself. If you are a King of the Jews, save yourself. What would the wrongdoers make of any of that? At this stage, Luke returns them to the story. Up to this point, he has given the reader a wide-angle view of the crucifixion scene. Now the focus narrows, and the reader is drawn close up. Up to this, the wrongdoers were treated as one. Now they are separated and individualised. Having gone through the same experience, they part company in their responses to Jesus. They remain nameless, distinguished for our purposes, as the first and the second. So Luke tells us, one of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Before the first wrongdoer speaks, the narrator guides audience reaction to him, saying that he is blaspheming or reviling, slandering, insulting and defaming. Blasphemeo in Greek. We have a context for this blasphemeo because it was recently used to describe how the high priest's men, after ridiculing, beating and blindfolding Jesus, kept heaping many other insults on him, blasphemeo, associating the wrongdoer with their company and their actions casts him in a negative light. When he speaks, the wrongdoer petitions, almost demands to be rescued from his terrible death. In the language he uses, he follows the script that he has heard from the leaders and soldiers. Messiah comes from the leaders and saving from both leaders and soldiers. This is the third taunt that takes place at the skull. Leaders, soldiers, wrongdoer. As such, it raises an enormous question. Is the first wrongdoer to be associated with the devil? This possibility arises because there was a previous occasion when Jesus was also confronted by three challenges. After his 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus was tempted three times by the devil. If you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. If you will worship me, it will all be yours. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Having failed to tempt Jesus, the Gospel records how the devil departed from him until an opportune time. Now, in Jerusalem, it would appear that the devil has indeed returned. This is manifested in various ways. First, as the chief priests and scribes look for a way to put Jesus to death, the narrator reports how Satan entered into Judas Iscariot and set the betrayal in motion. Second, that Jesus knows of Satan's return is clear 
from his warning to Peter at the Last Supper. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. And he goes on to warn Peter that he will three times deny him, as indeed Peter does. Third, Jesus further warns of satanic intrigues when he declares at his arrest how the powers of darkness are now in control. A point underscored by the cosmic gloom that descends in the three hours while Jesus dies. So Satan is busy and Satan is at work. The question is, is he at work in the first wrongdoer, as he appears to be in the leaders and the soldiers? At first glance, very closely indeed. However, Luke can be a very subtle writer, and he seems to separate what the wrongdoer says from the words of the devil, the leader, and the soldiers. This becomes very obvious in Greek. The if word that Satan, the leaders, and the soldiers share is the Greek practical I. If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, if he is the Messiah of God, if you are King of the Jews. Instead of repeating their if statements, the first wrongdoer poses a negative question with an adverb, uki. This usually expects the answer yes. So his question becomes, surely you are the Messiah, are you not? And the expected answer is, yes I am. It just shifts the emphasis slightly and raises a little doubt and creates a space between the wrongdoer and Satan, the leaders and soldiers. Luke could have repeated the if and left no room for uncertainty. However, while there is a potential loophole here, the audience is swayed by the description of the speech as blaspheming. And because the reader is primed to expect that one character will respond positively and the other not, blaspheming seems to confirm that the first wrongdoer is indeed the negative character. There's just one other thing to say about the slight ambiguity surrounding this man. He speaks directly to Jesus and almost seems to expect an engagement with him. This is, after all, a one-on-one -on -one dialogue, unlike the barrage coming from the leaders and soldiers. But the reader never knows if Jesus intends a reply because the first wrongdoer is interrupted by the second. Normally, the Luke and Jesus responds to challenges, but now he allows the second wrongdoer to speak and so gives him unusual prominence and affirmation. So what does he say? Luke tells us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we ourselves have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Before he speaks, Luke prepares the audience by informing them that the second wrongdoer rebuked the first, the pitamau. The reader knows how to receive this verb because we have already met it several times in the Gospel. Twice Jesus rebuked evil spirits, either silencing them or not allowing them to speak at all. Even more significantly, Jesus directed his disciples, if your brother sins, you must rebuke the offender. The implication of this is that Jesus supports the second wrongdoer in his reproach of the first. By rebuking his fellow, the second man is doing what Jesus says he must do, and indeed, what Jesus does himself. The second wrongdoer's rebuke may be assessed on various levels. First, unlike the first wrongdoer, he makes no plea for his life, recognising that there's no hope now of being saved from death. This realism mirrors Jesus' own acceptance of his coming death, a fate that he never tries to evade as he winds his way towards Jerusalem from 951 onwards. Second, because the men are being crucified together, he cannot understand 
how one sharing the same punishment as Jesus can join in the mockery. Third, the second wrongdoer takes responsibility for his actions and concedes that the crimes of he and his fellow merit this form of execution. While such a concession might be part of his pragmatic attitude to life and death, it also seems somewhat improbable, given the obscenely painful and ugly nature of death of crucifixion. However, it serves as a foil for the next point made by the wrongdoer, that unlike them, Jesus is an innocent man who has done nothing wrong. This is the fifth statement of Jesus' innocence, a street-level recognition to parallel earlier high-level affirmations of Pilate and Herod. And finally, while the text gives no indication whether the wrongdoers are Jews or Gentiles, believers or unbelievers, the second wrongdoer is characterised as one who fears God and who accepts that all are under God's judgment as they face death. The fear of God is a theme that runs through the Jewish Bible in its Hebrew and Greek forms. Basically, it signifies religious devotion in the richest and fullest sense of the phrase, that which every human being owes the Creator. The Jewish Bible closely links the fear of God with serving him, loving him, and obeying his laws. God as Creator is acknowledged as having authority over humans with the right to command them and to expect obedience and accountability. The biblical writers see this accountability as a positive virtue and the stipulations of Torah, the commandments, as a gracious expression of God's love. But in a relationship where there are laws and accountability, there is always the possibility of judgment. When someone is described as not fearing God, as the second wrongdoer pronounces the first, that person is deemed to indulge in evil deeds. Such people are not expecting God's judgment, but judgment always comes. On the other hand, the one who fears God and hates evil, as the second wrongdoer seems to do, is deemed blessed, has learned wisdom and discipline, and is on the way that leads to life and security. The fear of God image also features in the Gospel, especially in Mary's song of praise. There she extols how God my Saviour has mercy for those who fear him from generation to generation, an approach that reflects the Jewish biblical position of confidence in the goodness, mercy and trustworthiness of God. So when the audience hears the fear of God phrase on the lips of the second wrongdoer, they appreciate that, like Mary, a gospel heroine, he is voicing a laudable attitude towards God, one that promises mercy and blessings. They await the unfolding of the passage to see if this assurance will come to pass. So Luke tells us how the second wrongdoer continues. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The second wrongdoer now turns to Jesus addressing him intimately and directly with the personal name, Jesus. This is the only time in the Gospel that the name, indirect address, is not accompanied by some other designation or reverential title. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Son of the Most High, Jesus Master, Jesus Son of David. Not even his mother called the 12-year-old boy Jesus when she found him in Jerusalem at an earlier Passover instead calling him child. Nor did any of his apostles ever do so, his inner circle and closest companions. So with Jesus, it is the personal nature of the encounter that first strikes the reader. On this level, the second man might be addressing Jesus out of compassion for one seemingly dying without friend or family support and derided by all, including the first wrongdoer, who shares his fate and might be expected to know better. Whether the second wrongdoer believed that Jesus was the Messiah, or God's chosen one, or King of the Jews, or had a kingdom, or could save anybody, or was merely a deluded fool, 
His familiar use of the name is a means of combating the universal rejection. On another level, whether known or unknown to the wrongdoer, the name Jesus, Jesus, means the Lord saves or God is salvation. <coughs> the name is thus a play on the language of saving that has dominated the entire passion narrative. But the second wrongdoer does not ask to be saved. He asks instead to be remembered. In the Greek or Roman world, to be remembered was an important aspiration, since remembrance was a form of presence, a survival in the memory of another. The wrongdoer's request is especially poignant, as the dishonourable death of crucifixion was intended to obliterate the memory of its victims. The fear of being forgotten was made worse, because the crucified person was often denied burial, with families, if there were any, afraid to claim the body. This meant that the corpse was often left on a tree to rot, or as food for scavenging birds or dogs. There were rarely any of the usual Greek or Roman or Jewish funeral rituals, nor was there a grave marker, on which was often inscribed the request to be remembered. The theme of remembrance runs through both the Jewish Bible and Luke's Gospel. In the Jewish Bible, people remember God, God remembers his people, and specific characters, Hannah, Nehemiah, and Jeremiah, all call out in the same language of pleading, remember me. The verb to remember features six times in the Gospel, on the lips of Mary, Zechariah, the parabolic Abraham, and the men at the empty tomb. In all these contexts of gospel remembering, as with the dying wrongdoer, there are eschatological and liminal overtones of characters on a boundary between one state of existence and another. The request to be remembered invokes Jesus' own words at the Last Supper, when he urged the apostle to remember him in the ritual act of breaking the bread. <coughs> although, the although the vocabulary is different, and it is a Eucharistic occasion, the readers also understand how Jesus' request for remembrance, like that of the wrongdoer, highlights his vulnerability <coughs> and humanity as he too faces imminent death. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. <coughs> Mention of kingdom evokes another series of gospel and Jewish biblical associations. At one level, kingdom suggests worldly power and authority, like that enjoyed by Caesar or Herod. However, it is the kingdom of God <coughs> metaphor that resonates most, because it is a central component in the teaching of the Luke and Jesus. He directly implies the term 25 times and implies it on other occasions. Kingdom is a metaphor that runs through the Jewish Bible, suggesting not a space or place, but a dynamic notion of God ruling powerfully over his creation and his people. The Gospel reinterprets and reshapes this image of kingdom in terms of its relationship to the coming of Jesus. The narrative proposes that the kingdom has arrived in some way or to some degree, however partially or symbolically, in his person and his ministry. Jesus' words, deeds, and reordering of human relationships are signs of the kingdom's evidence, here and now, realized in the present moment. This is especially obvious in his cures and healings, in his dealings with life's unfortunates, and the many who have fallen by the wayside. But the gospel also presents the kingdom as a future yet imminent phenomenon, attested by the prayer of Jesus, let your kingdom come. So the wrongdoer's request to be remembered in the kingdom infers a recognition, however instinctive, that all those sneering have missed, that the one who is being mocked as Messiah and King, who is dying as a condemned wrongdoer, really is the royal Messiah, and that his shameful death does not end his claim to royal power, but is the means by which he will achieve it. Amazingly, the second wrongdoer seems to have no difficulty in differentiating between the appearance of the man dying on the cross and the mysterious reality of messiahship and kingdom. 
So while the second wrongdoer is being idealised as a model character of perception and insight, there is one unfavourable comparison being raised with this comparison, with his companion. <coughs> while the first wrongdoer includes his fellow accused in his plea, save yourself and us, the second man merely, merely requests remembrance for himself, remember me. By excluding his associate, the second wrongdoer replicates the lack of solidarity for which he berated his companion when he taunted Jesus. Again, it's Luke's way of nuancing characters, of leaving a little window of doubt or ambiguity concerning them. And finally, Jesus replies, Today you will be with me in paradise. The suffering Jesus responds with, with greater generosity than the wrongdoer expects. His final words to another human being before his death are filled with hope and reassurance. Whether the second wrongdoer made his request wistfully or seriously, out of sympathy, discernment or both, Jesus promises that he will not simply remember the wrongdoer after entering into his kingdom. The man will be with him in paradise this very day, the great Lucan today, Semeron. Paradise is an extremely rare word in the New Testament, occurring only three times. A borrowing from the Persian, Paradiesa, it is the word used in Genesis to describe the Garden of Eden. The condition of the redeemed Jerusalem in Isaiah, where God's people would be as a mortal garden, and the resting place for the souls of the righteous dead in the apocalyptical writings of late Second Temple Judaism. For Luke's readers, therefore, Paradise generates a multifaceted image, at once tangible and transcendent, of a verdant garden where God is close and the souls of the worldly dead receive their just reward. It is striking that although the wrongdoer requests the kingdom, he is instead promised paradise. From the point of view of the Luke and Jesus, it must be supposed that, with paradise, a different word is being used to convey a complex symbol of kingdom. On the level of the interacting characters, Jesus and the wrongdoers alike, the pastoral idyll of flowing water and blossoming trees evokes an image of peace and repose as different from the skull as can be imagined. With the promise, there might be some audience surprise that Jesus has made it all so unconditional and uncomplicated for the wrongdoer. All the man had to do was to ask. Jesus today answers the when of the wrongdoer's petition, and it incorporates a spectrum of meanings. On the one hand, and especially on this crucifixion day, it has an eschatological tone, referring to a dimension of salvation inaugurated at the death of Jesus. On the other hand, today, also has the literal meaning of this very day, not some indefinite time in God's plan. The narrator signals this immediacy by the inclusion of precise time references. Noon and three in the afternoon mark the hours of the actual today that is drawing to a close. However, throughout the Gospel, Luke also gave today a dual meaning of a chronological day there is also an eschatological moment of salvation. This is because where Jesus physically is, the work of salvation is also present. At the crucifixion, Jesus defines salvation as a kind of witness, a solidarity with him. With the language of today, with me and in paradise, Jesus promises the wrongdoer a share in his own destiny which he describes to the disciples that he moves as entering into his glory. The narrative leaves the wrongdoers there and the focus returns to Jesus. It is noon and Jesus dies at three. He dies unusually quickly for a crucifixion death. So the audience may presume that the two wrongdoers expire more slowly. Their story is not yet over. 
For the third time in the passage, they are present as silent witnesses to events. The wrongdoers observe, together with the readers, Jesus' death, the cosmic signs that precede it, the reactions that follow it, and the removal of his body from the cross. Unlike the body of Jesus, the narrative is not concerned with theirs. Instead, it is attentive first to their divergent reactions to their predicament, and second, to their different responses to Jesus and the results that this will have. Thus, while the perceptive, idealized second wrongdoer has been promised paradise, the fate and indeed the character of the first may be less certain. The reader is unsure whether his outburst results from an evil intent that associates him with the leaders, the soldiers and Satan, <coughs> or whether, under the stress of crucifixion, he is a simple-minded man, an everyman, driven to distraction by his situation, who imitates what he hears from the barrage of abuse around him. Furthermore, the reader remembers how he includes his associate in his misguided, if understandable, plea for deliverance. Despite provocation, Jesus neither chides the first wrongdoer, nor condemns him, nor corrects him. Instead, he does two things. First, he allows the second wrongdoer to respond, to put a perspective on the situation. And then he permits the first wrongdoer to hear the exchange between himself and the second man. While he awaited death, the first wrongdoer had time to consider the strange events in which he found himself a first-hand participant, culminating in his companion's reprimand, the dialogue between him and Jesus, and the promise of paradise. The second wrongdoer's story is unfinished. In this he resembles various other characters in the Gospel, Simon the Pharisee, Martha, the elder son in the parable, who are all portrayed as negative and ultimately open characters, who are left on a threshold of decision and potential change, where the reader never knows the outcome. However, the stakes are infinitely higher for the first wrongdoer, because while one can decide on a change of heart until the last hour of one's life, for him, the final hour has arrived and the time for decision is here. And it may be that the first wrongdoer more closely resembles the rich man in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, for whom parabolically it is too late <coughs> and for whom no bosom of Abraham awaits. There are two wrongdoers, one of whom is promised paradise and one whose fate is left unrecorded. It is this lack of closure and the uncertainty of destiny that engages the reader and makes this such a fascinating gospel passage. Well worth Luke's while in developing the story as he does. The wrongdoer's relationship with one another is involved and contingent. The outburst of the first wrongdoer is what allows the second man to speak. Hearing the first man's desperation brings the second wrongdoer clarity and recognition and gains him the promise of paradise. For his part, the second wrongdoer's rebuke represents for the first man a call to reality, to an acceptance of his fate, and to the need for decision. It thus provides him with an opportunity that he may never have recognised and he may or may not take. And I finish. On Good Friday, 1957, the great Swiss theologian Karl Barth delivered a sermon on the two wrongdoers to a prison community in Val. Barth is crystal clear on what he thinks is happening. For him, the wrongdoers represent the first Christian community, hanging on their crosses in fellowship and solidarity with Jesus. At the point of no return, unlike the disciples, they could neither sleep nor abandon him. They are the first to witness the actuality of Jesus' words at the Last Supper. This is my body, this is my blood. At the skull, they see the broken body and the spilled blood. And by being crucified themselves, they participate in a most intimate way in the same breaking and shedding. 
Because of this, Barth declares that all subsequent followers of Jesus must get in line behind the two wrongdoers, who were already first up there in front with Jesus at the skull. For Barth, the promise of paradise is given to both men, clearly, urgently, and without distinction. Whether or not they both accept it is part of the mystery that lies at the core of the healing. Thank you. Thank you.